One, two. Hey, everybody. Welcome out to uh, the History of Live Sound with Bob Pyle. It's a real honor to be asked to introduce Bob. Um, I don't have to tell anybody in this room who Bob is, you know, but Bob's got a million great stories, which I steal all the time. So every once in a while, I find myself talking to a civilian who doesn't know who he is, and I need to explain it. And this is what I say. I say, well, you know that little tubey thing that Peter Frampton and Joe Walsh used to make their guitars sound like a voice? And they go, yeah. So it's called a talk box, and Bob Heil invented it. If you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, he is the only equipment maker who has stuff on display there. And after a few, uh, after some work with The Who, Pete Townsend came to him and said, you know, I've got this idea for a rock opera, but in order to make it work, I need to be able to make Roger's voice fly around the room and come from different places. Can you do that? And Bob thought about it. He said, yeah, I can do that. So Bob went and designed this quadraphonic PA, and Pete Townsend went and wrote, wrote Quadrophenia. He didn't write it until Bob told him he could make it happen live. Um, there would be no touring live sound industry if it wasn't for Bob and other people like Bill Hanley and Alison Escal. He's absolutely a legend. I'm honored to call him my friend. And uh, without anything else, Mr. Bob Heil. All right, good morning. I guess it's afternoon, isn't it? Well, it depends on where you are. <laughs> I appreciate you taking time to come here today, and I, uh, I hope that we can uh, teach you a few things. But uh, wait a minute, I'm talking to engineers, so you already know these things. But it's kind of fun to go back and revisit some of the basics, because everything that we do is related to science. And uh, a lot of times we forget that and we try to push the envelope thinking, well, it'll be better if we did it with this brand or that brand. And we're so brand conscious today. Everybody forgot to listen. Listening is a mental process. Hearing is a physical process. Everybody hears and it's real loud and oh boy. But listening is such an art and um, I thought the best thing to do today would be to run through a, a PowerPoint that I put together on the history of what we're doing. And uh, you're going to see some very uh, fun things here. Things that started with me back in 1966 in the sound reinforcements business. However, my life started back in 19, actually 52, as a Hammond organist. And um, it also came along in 56 that I got into ham radio. Amateur radio was, without a doubt, my biggest teacher. It was better than any college education, as you're about to find out. Some of the gear that you see showing is reminiscent of the early 50s, of course, but I still have some of it, some of it, on the air, because I'm on the air a lot. But I built most of the things. Then I got into antennas, big time. I got into big antennas, big time. This is 1961, 62. This is a 128 element array. You got, am I in the way of the screen here, by the way? Maybe I should move over a little if I can. No, you're fine. We okay? This antenna is 128 elements, and they all had to be phased. Some of them had to be out of phase. Remember what I just said, because we're going to get into this in a little bit, and it really means a lot. But that antenna was a college education. And it, uh, it was all because of my loving parents that allowed me to put that up because right beside it 
was a 110 foot tower with a 30 foot, 36 foot long boom and some more elements. And I, I just loved antennas. But I learned to listen tuning these crazy pipe organs. I started as a Hammond organist in a restaurant, 52. In 1956, I became the substitute organist at the Fox Theater. And learning to tune those pipes were just unbelievable. And, and, and I didn't know that later on in life it was going to change a lot of your lives. That's where it came from. Then I got into building crazy Hammond organs. I was one of the first probably to cut them in half back in 1965, 66. And I got called by people in St. Louis that were producing shows to bring Hammond organs. They rented it from me. I uh, opened a little music store and I'd cut these things in half or I'd hook them up to four or five Leslie's. Don Leslie was a friend, so I learned a lot from Don. And uh, I'd get on these stages with people like Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and all those kind of people with their organs. But wait a minute. The PA were little columns with six-inch speakers in them to fill a 20,000-seat arena. But in 1966-67, that's what you did. Hammond organs. We could get into this a lot. Hammond organs started, by the way. Lorenz Hammond in 1929 invented the synchronous motor and he then built clocks, Hammond clocks. Sarah and I have about 50 of them. That's a little four note Hammond organ that we use to go around and demonstrate them. But here we are, ending up on these crazy stages, the Vanilla Fuds, the Buckinghams, and all these crazy groups, but they had no PA. Well, they had a PA, and that's what it was. And one day, my little music shop, I, I drove by the Fox Theater, and they were throwing out some speakers. And uh, by the way, this is 19, about 58. Pretty incredible store for, uh, uh, 60, I mean, a pretty incredible store for those days, for 68. Uh, but I, I knew that I had to bring new things. So I started playing. I bought a bunch of A7s. I was the largest sun dealer in the country and had become just infatuated with putting all this crazy stuff together for the stuff at Keele Auditorium. How did I know I was gonna go any further? Well, this became quite a, no, almost a, it, it was just a, a drug for me. And here's a guy that's never tasted beer or smoked a cigarette in my whole life. And I'm running around with all these crazy people. I'd go out to the park. There's one of our first systems. Who's the group? Anybody know? You probably never guessed. That's ZZ Top. <laughs> Without beards. And look at all the monitors. That was another thing I brought to the industry. Groups didn't have good monitors because they never figured out how to make them not feedback. You're going to learn that later. All kinds of people in the park in St. Louis came by. But we got the job because we had this crazy PA that we kept building and building. And then one day I drove by the Fox and they were throwing out their A4s. And I'm going, wait a minute. Hey, George Bales, the stage manager that used to bring me up and down when I was playing. I said, what are you doing with these big speakers out here in the alley? He said, well, we're, we're replacing them. And I said, can I have them? So he gave them to me. And I built this PA. We just kept building and building and building. And that's what came of those wonderful speakers from the Fox. I got into the, 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 the one on the, the left here is uh, JBL horns. They rang like a bell. <laughs> they were metal and I said we can do that better and I met a guy that had a fiberglass shop and so we opened a plant in Minneapolis and started building them in fiberglass and uh, wow man this is incredible for 1969-1970 and we just kept going that was one of my nicest sounding systems it was a big hi-fi system we had the big A4s we had 4560s front loads the, the lenses for the front with 30, uh, 375s on them. But then look at the tweeters. 
ended up usually with about 32 of those aside. I mean, it was a big hi-fi system. I loved all of this stuff, being able to produce quality audio. Because nobody cared about quality, they cared about loud. And I said, no, we got to do this right. Those um, W bins. Harry Olson is a wonderful engineer for RCA. He invented the ribbon microphone that you are so accustomed to seeing. The old, old time RCAs. That was a guy, that was a Harry Olson invention. So were those W bins. And I just kept going and going with all this. Well, one day I get this call, and he says, Are you, on? Are you high on? I'm going, Yes, sir. Who's this? Hey, this is Klitsch here. And I said, Paul Klitsch? Yeah. I'm going, This is God on the other end of his phone. <laughs> he invented the, the folded horn for hi fi, and, and he's calling me. I said, What can I do for you? You go out of cornfield, I can come and crash in. And I said, I beg your pardon. Ah, you live in that little town up there, you probably don't have an airport. I, no, we don't, but we have one south of here. He said, well, I want to come and see you. You, you got like, what, what do you got? 20, 30,000 watt? What is this? What is this? What do you got? I said, yeah, we've got a lot of power in this PA, which we did. Lots of Macintosh. And uh, he came to visit me. Flew his plane in, came to my place, followed me around all day. And it was really cool. Here's probably one of the smartest audio engineers ever. He's tall, right over my shoulder all day. Well, how, how come you doing that? How come? He wasn't cutting me down. He was on a learning curve here. Why is this clown doing this? Put me in his airplane, flew me back to Hope, Arkansas, spent the night there in his home. The next day, took me out to his lab. And I have to tell you people, seriously, those two days was like a drunk meeting Jesus. He <laughs> gave me all I needed to go back and start learning. You check out the Fletcher Munson curve. You go study what happened in 1930, 32, 33 with Bell Labs. You go pay attention, listen, learn to listen. And he was the guy that turned it around for me. And then we started really going. We opened our own fiberglass shop in Marissa. We opened our, we had all kinds of things we did in fiberglass. And he liked that concept because it didn't ring. But it was very difficult to do in wood. These are some of the outcomes of all of that. This, uh, this, these were marvelous systems in those days. And we built all this stuff in our little plant in Marissa. But it just kept getting weirder, bigger and better sounding. Big hi-fi systems, four-way crossover, and, and it was absolutely wonderful. It was Tommy Holman that pointed me to the crossover. I still have the letter he wrote me from a hotel in Springfield, Missouri, that he was gonna come and help me with, with the uh, crossover, it was great. This was a system we built for Jeff Beck. Jeff wanted to do something in and out fast in small venues with his new group, Bobby Tench. He didn't, really didn't like vocalists, but he was going to try it again. Incredible system. Okay, so roll in this one column and away you go, but look what the column had in it. It was a three-way system and it, it was great. By that time we had gotten into using some phase linears, but the problem were mixers. We, this is what the state of the art was, that was it. We had no real equalization, so I went, bought me a Longevin studio mixer. Found out, wait a minute, this isn't going to work, it's too sensitive. When you put this on a stage with a hundred and some dB coming out of these guitar amps, one of my roadies from Carbondale, Illinois said, hey, I got this guy, he's a friend of mine, we went to high school together, and he's coming out of college. Let's see if he won't come down here and help us, because he came out mid-year and he didn't have a job. So Tom Holman helped us redo the front end of that console, the electronic crossovers and all that, and rework our systems. And if you're not familiar, Tom Holman is the THX, Tom Holman Experience. In 1982, he went to work for Lucas, and you know the rest of that story. We were very blessed and honored to have him in our fold when he first came out of the University of Illinois and 
again, he was another icon that pointed me in the right direction when I really needed it because I didn't know, I'm a ham, don't forget that. Uh, amateur radio paid such a big part. But we did all this stuff, man. We were making st stage boxes, we were building subsnake stuff, road cases, when not a lot of people were doing this. That's the key. Today you might look at it and say, well, that's nothing we do. Yeah, but not in 1969, 70, 71. And so then we came up with our own crossover. We came up with little uh, mixers. That was a parametric EQ we did. And then the story about the crown. What you see in the bottom is an Omega amplifier. But it's a Crown DC 300. And i got to tell you this story. This is a great story. I wanted to buy Crown because we needed better power amps. The Macintoshes were falling apart. They were made to put on a walnut shelf. We're putting them in the back of a 40-foot semi without any kind of suspension in those days. About every gig, we'd have to fix four or five of them. But anyway, I go to Crown. I had gotten some money from the bank and had it in a briefcase, cash. I was going to buy 100 of them. And I go there. And Jim Beatty, never will forget his name, the sales manager, picked me up at the airport. We go in and, uh, well, about the time we walked in, the church bells are ringing. I'm going, ooh, hello, uh, this is Crown. He said, uh, excuse me, you're going to have to go to chapel with us. <laughs> you see, the story is that Clyde Moore was a very religious man. He had built a transmitter in South America and invented an antenna to cover all of North America with his Christian radio channel. And again, he was a ham. He wasn't an engineer, he was a ham. Figuring all this stuff out. And he needed better tape recorders so he could have tape of all of his broadcasts, so he built the crown tape recorder first. Well then, they got into building amplifiers and so I went over to buy these, and after the, every, by the way, every day at 10 o'clock, everyone had to quit working and went to chapel for 15 minutes, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so I sit down at his desk, and, okay, son, what can I do for you? I said, well, uh, Mr. Moore, I, I want to I buy some of your amplifiers. I, I want to buy 100 of them. You want to buy 100 of my amplifiers? What are you going to do with them? I said, well, we have this large sound system. We do a lot of touring with rock and roll. I didn't even get out of my, ma out of my mouth the rock and roll band. He comes flying up out of that, stood up and looked at me. He says, my amplifier will never, ever let the devil music be heard. <laughs> and sent me on my way. So as Jim Beatty is taking me back to the airport, you know what he's thinking, there's a whole bunch of cash in this uh, briefcase and he just lost a sale for 100 amps. A couple weeks later, Jim called me and says, I got this all worked out. He said, now you're gonna put these in cases, right? And I said, yes sir, we wanna put them in a box, total exit, we wanna put transformers, XLRs on the back, a fan and all, oh, it's great. We're going to sell you 100 of them, we're gonna license you to build DC 300 as a Heil amp. You can name it whatever you want. Go to Brady Drake in Milwaukee. That's who makes our stickers. And we have it all set up. And as you see, it became a Heil Omega amplifier. There is the true story. Uh, somebody must have got to Clyde later because they did get on with it. <laughs> we replaced all of the Macintoshes as great as they were. Then I had this other call from a guy, Bob Carver. He said, hey, how would you like to have a 700 watt amp? Well, that sounds good. He said, yeah, I, I'm thinking about building these amps, but um, if you can uh, buy like 50 of them and pay me up front, I can get the seed money, I'm gonna start this company, phase linear. I said, good. He says, well, we'll put your name on them and all that. I said, good. One other thing. In those days, everything, as you've been seeing, is black and green. I wanted them a different color. So when you sat in the 20th row, you didn't have to read the name, you knew what it was. So the 700 watts were purple and the 400 watts were blue. That's the story of why I wear purple shoes. <laughs> I haven't grown up yet because I don't know what I want to do when I get big, don't forget that. But anyway, that was the story of the phase linears. <laughs> I just found one recently, Sarah and I found this baby and I didn't keep some of this stuff, and I should have, but I kept a lot of it, but not all of it. There were some early things of the 
of the crowns on the racks that we would build. And uh, just great, great stuff in the early days. And one day I get this call from the stage manager at the Fox. And he said, um, I said, George Bales. And I said, yeah, George, what's up? He says, you still got them damn big speakers? I said, I still got them big speakers. He said, well, uh, there's a group here that came in and they don't have a PA. And I thought about you first up here. Talk to this guy. He handed the phone to Jerry Garcia. Well, if you know the history of the Grateful Dead, well documented, and we just lost this wonderful guy a couple weeks ago. Owsley did a lot of things with drugs, and those guys were his guinea pigs, so to speak. And uh, he would buy them all the gear they wanted if they would experiment with his mixtures. Well, he was on probation from the feds in California, but they were going to do this short little tour through the Midwest. The feds heard about it. That night after the show in New Orleans, they confiscated the PA and Owsley, took them back to California. We didn't have cell phones. We hardly had good communications at all. So the group comes on, they're getting on the stage to set all their stuff up, there's no PA. That was really a huge entrance to how Heil Sound got where we are today. Because I told Jerry what I had. We took it up that night. We didn't get there and get set up till about 9 o'clock. He didn't care, and it was incredible. And that night at the Fox Theater really was when the Grateful Dead got to hear some really big, wonderful sound, monitors and all this kind of stuff. And it, 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 was, it was something, let me tell you especially for a little kid from Marissa on that lovely stage of the Fox Theater that I practically grew up on and seeing all of these people because a Grateful Dead concert that day there were more people, people on the stage it, did, there was, it just flowed everybody was everywhere they were having such a good time and um, boy good thing it didn't have any kind of smoke inhibitors in that room oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> But anyway, that was the start. We went right out of there that night. They wanted us to go on that little tour. We hit the front page of Billboard that Ye Old Music Shop got the, con the contract of the Grateful Dead. Oh, you probably can't read it, but the sticker on the back of my B3 said Ye Old Music Shop. You probably saw it earlier. That was my store. So I get this call from Garcia. He said, uh, a couple days later, he said, uh, uh, you know, we can't pronounce all these ye old whatever. So we're just going to call you Heil Sound. Is that okay? I said, that'd be fine. So it was Jerry Garcia that named my company. And a lot of people don't know Heil Sound. That was no big deal. No, it really started out a little different. Well, the word quickly spread, front page of Billboard and all this, and these groups are just calling us like crazy, and we're going out doing all kinds of tours, and then we met up with Joe, of course, and Walsh and I have become really good friends. Yeah, not because of the music. The music was there. But he's a ham, WB6ACU. And he is an incredible ham radio operator. He loves ham radio. And that's what keeps us together. I tell this story, and it happened so many times on the tour bus, in the back of the bus, back in the James Gang. They had a little Atlas transmitter. We'd go out and string up a wire from the bus to the building or whatever. I remember one time the tour director came in and he said, came running in all nervous. He said, Joe, Joe, they're clapping. They want you. You're supposed to be on stage. Just a minute. Hang on. We're talking to a guy in South Africa. And when I get finished talking to this guy, I'll, I'll be in there. not going away. And he'd finish his contact with the guy in South Africa, and we'd go inside and we'd play Funk 49. And it, it, it was fun. And I, I could be here all day telling you. Then he got the idea that he was going to form this new band, Barnstorm, but he had used this talk box. And um, he wanted to know how we could do it. Loud. Well, the box he used came from a studio in Nashville, and it was an eight-inch speaker and a funnel with a hose. That's what recorded Rocky Mountain. 
But we had to figure out how to do it live. So it was he, I, and his roadie, Crinkle, went out to the plant, and we figured out how to take a 250-watt JBL driver, build the right kind of high-pass, low-pass builders we needed, put a hose in it, bingo, talk box. And so that's how that all started, and it, it was just so much fun. Uh, and I started building it just for grins because it was, kept, it was catching on. The song was quite popular. And uh, turned out that in a couple years, why uh, Frampton came along, Humble Pie, we were doing all the Humble's work, and then they took him out as a solo act. And I gave one to his little gal, Penny, for a Christmas present. She would call me and says, I need a Christmas present for Peter. And so I gave him the talk box, which changed his career. He will tell you that. There's a great video on our site that he and I did last year. And you really want to go see it. It's really neat. We sat down in a, at uh, one of the places in Nashville and talked about old times. And it was really kind of fun to kind of re relive those days that Peter and I had together. Great stuff. But there were some of the talk boxes we built, a lot of them. And then Sun had gotten involved uh, so much in our sales, and they wanted me to build their, help build their new coliseum. So I did. Nobody had a mixer. They had a little mixer, a little vocal masters and stuff. Nobody built a real mixer for live sound. So we put this together. It's kind of interesting. I, I built some of the boards in Marissa on Vector Ward, and they were building the panels and stuff out in Tualatin, Oregon. So I took it out there, and we put it all together, and man, it was pretty cool. Had built-in electronic crossover. As you can see, had equalization. It had monitor sends, it had tape sends, it had meters on every channel. You look at that and laugh and you say, well, yeah, well, not for those times. See, that's, that's, the, that's the part you have to keep in mind. You're talking here in 1970, I think it was 170, we got that going. It's hard to see perhaps, but that's a vector board. I hand wired that. What we did and the, I still do it. Today, they don't do it like that, but we're hams. That's what we do. That's how we build <laughs> prototypes. And uh, it worked really good. And then I got this call. And the call came from the WHO management and said, uh, where's that big PA I, uh, we read about? Where is that? I said, well, it's in Chicago. Well, um, we need it, like, now. I said, yeah, OK. And uh, we had amassed a pretty good sounding PA out of a cardboard box now. You could come into a store and buy this. You could come in and buy everything from the microphone to the tweeters in a cardboard box from Sun. We were building the fiberglass horns for them. And uh, they said, well, uh, you got to get it out here. Well, I said, we're in Chicago. We can't be there tomorrow. Yeah, well, fly it here. So we did. And it was the only time I ever rented a 707. I mean, I rented a 707. A little kid from Marissa, are you kidding? Well, we did. That was the concert that changed the world. I really believe this. When I look back on everything, the Who came over here, they had brand new music, they had a brand new sound, and they came over with six little whim columns, Watkins Electric Music had little eight-inch speakers, six of them, they were going to fill Madison Square Garden. Sure they were. But they didn't know. In that time that they had not toured from the late 60s to 70, the sound system world, and I guess had a little part of that, really punched up a lot. So, we came out with this. We did two years of Who's Next. The scary part for me, that console was that hand-wired vector console. And every night I'm going, please, please. <laughs> that console is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it still works. The day we put all that together, I just, I wanted to do it. I said, wait a minute, and I hooked it up to make sure and it still works. How's that for hand wiring? Yeah. 
So anyway, we, it, I, just, I think about it so much, but that tour was incredible. Everybody learned so much, and I mean everybody. And, and the Who, we could be here all night talking about the, the Who were great. They were such an influence on my life. They wanted monitors all big monitors. They didn't want anything in front. Pete didn't like that because he was jumping around. And Mr. Roger and his microphone, well, I figured out it was time to put big side fills. I had more side fill than most bands were carrying for front for these guys. <laughs> but I figured out, and you're going to hear it in just a little bit, I'm going to prove it how I did it. Because a lot of people say, how did you do that? You will notice the picture with Pete. There's a monitor right here because he was starting to lose his hearing then. And I never will forget, we were at the Cow Palace for four days and I took a tone generator with me because he played so trebly. Oh man, this is blowing through. And I took a tone generator out during sound check and I said, hey Pete. And he was gone after about 5K in those days. And so that's why everything was such a crazy thing in those days with him. But that was his monitor. I had a, that was a 2482 on that horn about three feet from his head. But the thing is, they were very directional horns and they would know where it was. The same thing with Roger. I had that side fill. Uh, did I, no, I didn't have a, another picture of that, but that side fill was on both sides. And we had a pattern right straight across with 40 degree, 60 degree radial stacks. So there, there really was a pattern. When you got back here, it wasn't as brilliant as it was out there. And if you ever watch Roger in the early days, he'd always do one of these things. And people think he was dancing. No, he wasn't. He was trying to find where the hot spot was. <laughs> and when he knew where it was, you check it out. I'm serious about this, and that's how he knew where he could go and how far he could go. And if he really needed to hear something, he would drop the mic and come back. And he never missed when he did that one. Never. It was, uh, it was just so much fun. Here we were in Dallas setting up. This was after we got rid of most of the sun stuff. We, got, we brought out the big stuff. This was later. Then I got into building a lot of systems for just people. Sound companies, bands. And um, it, this was all just such great stuff. Oh, there's Pete. That's uh, that was Tommy's uh, high school friend. I didn't know he was in there. Hey, Lloyd, you in these pictures anywhere? <laughs> I haven't seen myself yet. Yep, Lloyd was with us in those days, so he knows. And then I built this little mixer, a modular mixer for like. 600 bucks. If you didn't have money to build eight, uh, to buy eight channels, buy four. We'll put blank panels in it. And, and it was, I was building this for, for, for bands that couldn't afford the big stuff, but it was big stuff. That thing still holds up today. I know people are still using it. Had two band EQ, monitor sends, pan pots. It was a, it's a wonderful thing for 1971 now. And uh, we, we really, I think changed the direction of where things went in those days. They got away from the little four-channel mixers. And uh, it just it was so much fun being able to build all this stuff and make people happy. And uh, what you just saw, most all of that's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we're very honored by that. That was a 1974 mixer. I guarantee you that will still handle today. It, it, it was wonderful. I had switchable mids. and. Uh, Again, we were just experimenting, and I, I got to bring all of this technology to the forefront. Then I met this guy, Don Hartwig, what a great engineer. So we got to build our own power amp, and we did, and it was great. And when you bought the power amplifier, you got an anvil case with a spare module. It was a modular power amp. You got a spare module for your mixer, if you got a mixer. There was a screwdriver, you can see it in there. There was a screwdriver, there was a spare fuse box, a spare fuse holder, because they were kind of weird, and a quarter. The quarter was to call me, because usually the bands didn't have much money, and so they could call me. 
Now what they would do is they would take a break if they blew aside on their amp and within 10 minutes they could replace the side, put it in the anvil case and throw it on a Greyhound bus. Greyhound buses were great in those days. We'd fix it and send it back to them. Why are we seeing that today? I don't know. I don't know. People don't care anymore. It's just way beyond my thought. But these are package systems that we built, and we built thousands of these pieces uh, in Marissa, Illinois. With 35 people, we were just having so much fun. And uh, this, this is a group, the, the two guys that bought this system. I still see them at shows once in a while. They were on the road for years as a sound company. There's another one from up in the Milwaukee area. Kind of different than a vocal master, huh? But it all came from a cardboard box. That was one of the first NAM shows. And that was the first NAM show that ever had a big PA. Talk about make people go crazy. The little guy on the, on the cart that run around saying, you can't play too loud. <laughs> For about two days while we're setting it up, it was too much fun. I probably shouldn't tell this story. Come on. Are you going you gonna to turn all this on? And, oh, absolutely. What do you think I'm wrong? Well, you can't, you can't do that. It can't be real loud. Right, well, they're going to turn it on. You know? We never even hooked it up, but I can tell him. <laughs> but it's fun. I, mean, I have fun. I, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in England, of course, when I was with The Who, and we imported the Mellotron over here first and sold a lot of Mellotrons. What a great instrument that was. A whole bunch of tape loops. So significant with uh, a lot of the bands back in those days. Moody Blues, a lot of that stuff you hear, the flute music. And not a flute, it's a Mellotron, but it was recorded flute on the loops. It was, it was a nightmare to keep going. Then I got this call from Pete one day after the Who's Next years. Come over here, I want to talk to you. I got an idea. So I went to his wonderful studio up on the second floor of his home. And uh, he said, hey, quad sound is big right now. This was 1973. He said, do you think you could make a PA that we can move Roger's voice around the room? Talking about arenas now. And I said, yeah, no is not in my vocabulary. And we did. He said, OK. And this was really cool. When I left his home, he said, you go build it, and I'm going to go finish writing it. Knowing that he could do that, he finished Quadrophenia. Uh, a little personal note, Quadrophenia, of all the works that I have done in my life, you need to go back, think about this day and this moment, listen to love reign over me. When we are all gone by about two or three hundred years, Love reign over me is going to be like Mozart today. I truly believe that. That was one of the most impressive pieces of written music that I have ever heard. Go back and listen to it. I'm talking about listen. Mentally dissect what he's doing in that song. And you talk about a thrill. It's one of you guys that mix sound every night for your respective jobs and bands. I'm sure you feel there's, there's a certain time, there's a feeling you get, man, this is really good. That was my good time to mix Quadrophenia. Although a lot of the other of it was whatever, but I love that song. And this is a mixer that IES, which was a sister company of ours in England, was building a console. So I got together with Bill Hoff and I said, Bill, we have to do this. That's the mixer we built. They built four of them, we got two of them, and we did Quadrophenia and lots of other bands with, with the mixer. That mixer is in the Rock Hall. It was an amazing piece. The thing weighs about 400 pounds, it's crazy. But it was all in case each channel was in its own steel chassis, and it was done right. And uh, I, would, I was just really thrilled to be able to come at that time in my life, meet up with Bill, and be there for Pete and history, because there it is in the Rock Hall. That is a display on the floor of the Rock Hall. It was right before they put the glass over it, so I was the last one to touch it. But it's, uh, it's there for all to see. The speaker on the left was one of the many cabinets in the rear channels for our rear channels. And they were not big 
eight wild things, they were just there for an effect, but we had six of those and some subwoofers in the back on each, uh, each side. But that box is in the Rock Hall, so it's actually one of the, the ones that traveled. That's a cool picture here. It was the old barn in St. Louis Hockey Arena that's gone now. And uh, over in the corner here is uh, Pridden and I trying to figure it out. Pridden was there in front of the house guy. I was taken at 4 o'clock in the afternoon from the back. Kind of a fun picture when you look at that to see you guys that do production today have to sit there and laugh because wow but no you didn't have to laugh that's what built the history it was crazies like us trying to make it happen when we didn't have all the equipment and all the technology that you have today that was quadrophenia in st louis in 1974. and it just it just went on from there it, it was such a wonderful part of the history of sound when you think about it all of these great people that came up and did things. And then the mini rock festivals, we did so many of those crazy things. I, I had these big Olsen bins, you can see on the outside, we had the Olsen bins stacked. And you, you know how it is, every time you stack them this way, it comes down this way. And I'm telling you, we had some low end out in the end of the field, it was great. Uh, great, great times. But uh, there's the Mississippi River Festival, if you've ever heard of that. Another piece of my life. We were the house sound there. This was on the college campus of SIU, Southern Illinois U, just across the river from St. Louis. Six nights a week, that thing played. And it, had, it was a summer home of the, of the St. Louis Symphony. And on, on Sundays, they would have the symphony play. But then they would have everybody from Dolly Parton to uh, Janis Joplin to The Who. The Grateful Dead, everybody played there. Everybody came through there. Jackson Brown even wrote one of his songs while he was in the hotel that weekend. That was a, a remarkable experience for me because, just think about that, we did it for seven years, six nights a week, while I was doing all the other things. I had wonderful, wonderful people that worked for me, but I was the guy that had to dream all this stuff up and figure it out and build it while they're out there executing it. And the River Festival was great. It was, it was really something. But um, ham radio still took preference in my life. There's Joe and I and the uh, Queen Mary. They have quite a radio station at the Queen Mary. And uh, that's an interesting picture. I was with Joe a few years ago. <laughs> he was playing the solo gig in Long Beach. And he'd gotten this new high lot. And he was so proud of it. He had two of them. Because I finally talked him into using smaller amps. And let the PA do it. And uh, he got in the solo amp. And we did our sound check. OK, cool. All of a sudden. His guitar tech, it was about 10 minutes before showtime. He comes running over to me and says, Oh my gosh, I can't get one of the high watts to turn on. What are we going to do? I said, Well, let's go fix it. Now, we're about 10 minutes before showtime. And um, it's one thing that I try to do. I always try to carry a screwdriver with me. <clears throat> I got in there and took the top off. Luckily, I could get it with my little screwdriver. And son of a gun. Would you believe the power switch was bad? The fuse was good. And so I took my screwdriver, you know, something, okay, let's try this. Shorted the power switch, it came on. I go, whoa, what is this? So I went back in the back, I got a piece of wire, wrapped it around the switch, put it all back together, didn't tell Joe. He did the concert, then I told Joe, and he was cool. He said, yeah, only a ham could have figured that out. Because the engineers would have taken it back and put the scope on it. They'd have measured all the voltages and tried to measure the impedance, and then they would have done this and that. Oh, heck no, we only have 10 minutes here, come on. That's Bob Heil. I just, I'm sorry. I, I just, it's all learned from this crazy stuff. You know, it just, it followed me through. <laughs> I got into the satellite world. Because of ham radio, I was a satellite dealer of the year in 89, putting up thousands of these things. I would come to shows like this, the satellite show, and teach dealers how to do that. Because who could, who but a ham could figure out how to find a satellite 23,000 miles away in the beginning? And I love that. 
and then I got into home theater. Uh, Direct TV put me on one of their beta tests for about eight to nine years. Uh, the Hubbard family that actually owned the license for it in the early days. And I had one of the test dishes in 91, got very involved. I was on television and radio for 25 years in St. Louis High Tech Heil. And I did all these little shows and I did a radio show every Wednesday night. And then they would send me to shows like this and we'd broadcast back or tape things. And we actually did the live broadcast back to the, to the station when DirecTV was introduced in this hall at CES. And these are all fun things, but it had nothing to do with sound, but it had everything to do because we were bringing sound together. I moved in a little building that we're in now, and it was a little home, and that's what it was. That's what it became. And that's what we did. We'd go into homes and make home theaters from them and really make things work. And uh, I did that for many years. We'd build, this was Ozzie Smith's theater, by the way, his home. I was on the Today Show, they selected my theater as their Christmas gift that year. So we hauled all that up there, and Andy Parr at the time was on. Just all kinds of fun things, and at one of the shows, why we were working all closely with Dolby, while Ray Dolby was there, and it was, again, all of these great icons that I, w I was able to work with and around, and I, I would pick up things from all of them. Now comes the real part of why you're here. Joe asked me to build him a better microphone. He said, hey, my ham radio microphone is better than my Shure. I said, oh, come on, Joe. We're sitting in his kitchen. He said, no, you come on. Come here. So he takes me downstairs and his little studio, and he plugs in his beta. This is a big time beta. Hello. And I'm going, oh, okay, what's wrong with that? He said, well, listen to it. I said, yeah, it's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, no, it's not? You know, Joe is incredible. I mean, his ears are incredible. He said, it doesn't have any articulation. And man, what happened to, the, what happened to this? I thought, it had, I thought it was supposed to have some kind of pattern. It does. You've got to be right here. And if you move <laughs> off a half an inch, it changes tone. I don't want that. My ham radio mic doesn't do that. I said, well, it's not supposed to. Well, make it that it didn't. So do something. <laughs> so I did. And you see, I don't play games here with you guys. I could have a little mixer up here or two cables, but then I get guys say, oh yeah, he's playing games. No, he's not. This microphone is so much more articulate. It's got such a better frequency response. But here's the big part. You can move around on it. And you can go the full distance and it works beautiful. It doesn't change tone. And that is an important part in what we're trying to do. But then you get in the rear and nothing. And you down. How did you do that? Well, I did that because I told you a while ago you're going to remember that antenna. That antenna had so much to do with all of us because we finally got to bring to the industry something that the big boys haven't done why haven't you done you're the engineers why haven't you figured this out they don't care here's two microphones that are absolutely identical another thing we're going to learn here is 3 dB I have a 5,000 watt PA and it's not loud enough so I'm going to go out and buy five more I'm going to get 10,000 watt how much did that going to come up? What? 3 dB? You got it. How loud is 3 dB? You know, we all forget this. When I bring this mic up, it's going to be 3 dB louder. Yes, it is. I'm not playing a magic act here. This is science. It's going to make you think when you go away. How important are things? 3 dB is not very much. The human can hardly hear 3 dB. That was just a little side note while I had it hooked up for you. <laughs> now comes the good part. This is a plug that's out of, it's wired out of phase. Still works fine, still sounds the same. Now comes the real reason for my existence in this business and a lot of other things I did. Because when you take two signals out of phase, Nothing. 
Oh, they still work. Nothing. So, Joe says, hey, do something. Make me a microphone. Then I got tremendous front pattern, tremendous frequency response. And I did that because the diaphragm is an inch and a half. It's huge. But I have all of this side stuff. Well, what's that about? What that's about? There's a tube in here, a little mounting tube about an inch in diameter that the capsule sits on top of. And it collects all of this stuff from the rear and the sides. Everybody else got four little bee holes up here. That's not enough. <laughs> I want 40 dB a rear. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. And oh, I have a cordioid. I have a suit. I don't want a cordioid suit, but it's got a spike on the back. What in the world do we want that for? Why are you allowing them to let you do that? Because nobody's talking to them and they ain't listening. Well, I did listen. I do listen. And I said, whoa, Joe, I didn't know this was going on.